Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. It's wonderful to see so many people here in person and I think we've got about 300 people online. We're live streaming this event. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this lecture is taking place the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I pay my respects to their elders past and present, as well as elders of other communities in the room or joining us online. And today is National Sorry Day. We all have a responsibility to listen and learn from the stolen generations and their families. The forced removal of tens of thousands of First Nations children from their families and homes is a truly appalling chapter in our history. An important step to healing is to recognise the very deep and complex trauma this has caused and continues to cause. It is vital for all Australians to reconcile with our past for a greater future together. Thank you. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Laura Collister and I am the CEO of Wellways Australia. I am very excited to welcome you all here tonight as we bring back our annual public lecture. I started in this role only a few months before the pandemic started in 2019. So tonight, after more than two years of attending events online from my house, it is such a pleasure to see so many of you here in the room tonight. But it'd be wrong to think that the pandemic is over. And we have two notable, notable absences from this event tonight. Firstly, Wurundjeri woman Emma Mildenhall was planning to do the welcome to us all this evening. She gave us some late notice that she has COVID and has been unable to attend. And that has also affected our Auslan interpreters who are also ill. We truly apologise to anybody who's inconvenienced by not having the Auslan interpreters here we have arranged for Ausland interpreting to happen on our recording. This is the first time we've been able to beam this lecture live to others, and we are excited. So to those people who are watching from around the country, more than 300 people, your support and enthusiasm is evidence of how important and timely this conversation is. This evening, together, we will explore how we can ensure the lived experience voice is genuinely included in decision-making across the mental health sector. We know that consumers are best placed to tell us how the system should work to best support recovery. To do this, we must have lived experience creating, solving, and making decisions at the highest level of management and governance. As it stands, boards, bureaucrats and managers, people like many of us here tonight, must transform what we do, our practice, to make this change effective. And it can be uncomfortable work. Power sharing is hard. There is no quick fix, and we must resist the temptation to move quickly to find the answers. Transforming our practice can't be just about making more space at the decision-making table to let more people in. It must be authentic. Authentic engagement is required. True transformation should challenge us and the beliefs that we hold which brings me to our absolutely amazing speaker, Debbie Hamilton. Debbie's name 
was one of the first raised when we started discussing bringing back this lecture. Debbie is a systemic mental health advocate who was elected to the first ever National Consumer Council and was pivotal in the development of a consumer voice in both the Hunter Mental Health Service, now the Hunter New England Mental Health Service, and Richmond Fellowship. Debbie has a vision to change the system, in particular the NDIS, to better suit the needs of people with psychosocial disability. Debbie herself has a bipolar illness and an NDIS package or support. Debbie has professional experience working as both a registered nurse and a doctor. She sits on various committees, including Wellways Quality and Safety Committee and the Pharmacy Guild of Australia. I hope and I know that Debbie will challenge us all here this evening. So I'd like to welcome Debbie to the stage. Now I want you all to know that I shake all the time, but because you're all so intimidating, it's a lot worse. <laughs> And the other thing I want to tell you is that, isn't this great? It's just like seeing me on Zoom. <laughs> That's the way you'll recognise me. I love it. <laughs> well, I was going to introduce myself, but I think I've been lovely introduced. I want you to know, though, I do this work because of the injustices that occur. My lived experience has left me to the lofty desire of trying to improve the mental health system. and I use my experience of recovery to fight for others to have better experiences. Slide, please. Well, I thought I'd tell you a little doctor story. So I'm in second year as a, a doctor, second year, and I'm in the emergency department as a um, lone person at three in the morning with two nurses, and all of a sudden, two ambulance men come running into the hospital, come running into the emergency ward, and they say to me, it's coming, it's coming, there's a baby coming in the back of our ambulance. And I think, shit, I don't know anything about delivering babies, because I just scooted it through that term and avoided it, so that I can't deliver a baby. And so what I did was, I went out to the ambulance, and the ambulance guys flung over the doors, and this woman, of course, is in labour, poor thing, and I take her pulse, which is totally useless, <laughs> and say, you'll make it, you'll make it, and I close the doors, and off we went, and I was so lucky she didn't deliver in the ambulance, and it's a bit of like lived experience in that we really want lived experience to come and be in all the positions and everything, but it's incredibly complex to do it. Slide, please. We can't go ignoring the fact that we need to critically review and improve the input of lived experience voices so that they're better heard and more effective in leadership roles, particularly. It is important not to just keep lived experience positions. It's important to evaluate also how they're going and how they could be improved in our sector. This talk is a reflection on lived experience governance. It's based on the work of Mary O'Hagan, Louise Byrne, Till Bikes, Larry Davidson and Anthony Stratford. Slide, please. I stand on the shoulders of impressive peer leaders, such as Marinda Epstein, who does the best comics, and Indigo Dea, and members of the Consumer and Carer Forum. Slide, please. Today, I want to explore the complexities of developing and embedding lived experience into mental health services. And mental health leadership, leadership of 
using lived experience in services. Everyone says, we must have lived experience. It's about time all the studies show it makes a difference. Have them on committees, have them on boards, have them as executives. But is it effective? Are we just going through the motions? Are we actually really achieving as much as we could, or more importantly, much as we should? Slide, please. So firstly, a definition of lived experience, because I think that's important. This one is by Louise Byrne and Till Wikes. Lived experience as mental health challenges that have caused life as we knew it to change so significantly, we have to reimagine and redefine ourselves, our place in the world and our future plans. That's how I see lived experience. It's about losing control and finding a way back to get that control again of your life. Slide, please. Now, I want to talk about the medical model for a while because it pervades everything mental health services are about. I'm good at the medical model. I did medicine. <laughs> But it is about control, and recovery is about regaining control. It's by far the dominant paradigm that we all operate in, and we don't even know it. Every time we view someone as unwell, not compliant with treatment, a risk to themselves or others, any time we think this would be good for someone, we're in the medical model. The fact that all mental health services err on the risk, on the sorry, err on the side of risk management rather than what might benefit is an example of the medical model working. And it interferes so often with recovery processes. Slide things. With the lived experience movement. There are different paradigms. There are those who feel that the medical model is right and that suits them and they want to live in the medical model. But there's those on this side who think of mad pride and they think of surviving the psychiatric centre or they might see themselves as users. These people, these people, are the ones were the originators and the movers and the shakers of the lived experience movement. They are my elders. They are the ones who forged the ideas of the importance of the lived experience being in various mental health services all across Australia. And they helped us all, everyone, see a different vision of how things could be improved. They developed the foundations and hard-fought rights to peer work, system change, co-design, our places on boards and committees. The more uni work I do, the more I read mad stuff. And I increasingly sit on that side of the spectrum. But I know mental health politics is complex. It's not black or white or one or the other. I sit though in the mad anti-psychiatry world and I think it is really important for systemic lived experience leadership. Slide please. The notion of recovery is very important to that leadership. Byrne, Davidson and Stratford came up with three levels of recovery. So there's recovery personally, where someone feels empowered to pursue their hopes and their dreams to find purpose in life. 
There's a second level of recovery, and peer workers are a good example of this, where we share our experience of recovery and hope and act as advocates and navigators of the system to others. And the third level is about senior leadership. People with lived experience of recovery occupying senior leadership roles, sitting on boards, on advisory committees, being lived experience designated executives, working on social policy, managing plans, education, program development and evaluation. Slide, please. We need, though, lived experience leaders who know that nothing without us, nothing about us without us, results in far better services. This is being understood and increasingly accepted by lived experience organisations, as you'll hear from Bimiak later, and being in, in New South Wales, where I come from. But we need to proceed cautiously. As Mary O'Hagan has noted, speaking of leadership, there's a need for ongoing mentoring, tailoring training, and proper career progress. We need to create very clear roles, develop sort, um, sound support structures, and good supervision by lived experienced people, not other managers. We could use more lived experienced people in senior executive roles, and we need to install in them, in their belly, the importance of human rights and social justice values, because I think that is central to good lived experience leadership. I love Byrne, Stratford and Davidson's note that lived experience leaders importantly bring a deep and profound understanding of recovery. That the broader field in mental health services, quite frankly, still struggles with. Not everyone with lived experience can be a leader. You need lived experience plus good politics. Mm. Lived experience leaders intentionally view and work from the perspective of lived experience. Slide, please. So I think it's timely at this time, that was good, wasn't it? Timely at this time to progress and discuss some of the difficulties or the complexities and the messiness about it. I really believe that there's a need to better develop the theoretical frameworks around lived experience. We need to really nut it out in academia. What is our role? Well, we need to nut it out everywhere, really. What is our role? What's actually our executive purpose? How clear is our role in committees and boards what does the lived experience person actually do or offer? And this is important because so often our agenda, our lived experience agenda, is co-opted into being in a committee. It's also important to clarify who or who we want to be leaders and who they represent. So when someone's on a committee or in an executive position, who do they actually represent? Because I think it's a question to ask, do they represent the people in the organisation or do they represent a particular theoretical um, framework? It's not good enough to have people with lived experience as social workers or a lived experience person who also is a doctor this is because, as I've pointed out, there's a different whole way of thinking as of lived experience, and it's very different from a professional role. 
And that means that it doesn't work. It doesn't work for the lived experience framework. Most organisations don't have any lived experience, leadership positions in the organisation. They're not there to contribute to the recovery agenda. Where are they? They should be there by now. Slide, please. The most obvious problem is the power inequality. I sit on boards where there's one of me and eight others. I sit on another committee where there's one of me and there's 30 other people. That's for a big trial that's going on. And I go there and I think, okay, I'm getting paid for this. I'm certainly not doing any work. <laughs> and tokenism is much less likely to occur when people have a, a, a task that's a real word task. It's not just some pretty thing in an organisation's name. So despite the lip service, lived experience knowledge isn't held in the same esteem as being a doctor or a lawyer. Who thinks my credibility or people do because I've been a doctor rather than my lived experience? Our, our credibility is questioned and paternalism is rife. I have to say, one of the problems for lived experience leaders is called their patient identity. So I'll give you an example. For me, I've had all those things. I've had involuntary admissions, forced medications, in solitary, been restrained, etc., etc., etc. And it's hard for me to buck the system. This is a system that really held me down. And these were very traumatising events. And you know, like, I've got a lot of guts getting up here, but I have trouble speaking up sometimes. So if I have trouble speaking up sometimes, imagine how hard it is for other people. Slide, please. The other thing is, pursuing human rights doesn't make you popular. And it's always good to remember that. Far from it at times. And, you know, people who sit on committees often get co-opted into the committee and say yes, rather than really stand their ground. Which is why we really need to clearly clarify the role of lived experience leaders. Now, I want to tell you, we would never have got to the point we are today without allies. People in mental health services who've listened to us, who've stood beside us, you've shared your power and that makes such a difference. Working beside us, you've championed our cause and it's invaluable. We need to develop our dialogue around solidarity across lines of difference with the goal of bringing about real concrete change. Slide, please. Now, I thought I'd tell you a little parable and it's set in World War I and by no means I don't want to offend anyone. Now, this is World War I, and, and I've read a lot about World War I. You, I don't know why I love it. And um, I, you have one side of in a trench and the other side in a trench. And in the middle was no man's land. And it was quite often that the two sides would get together in no man's land and have a chat, if not a party on occasion. So the Germans would meet with the Australians and do all kinds of things, decide on, on what they're going to do in terms of collecting bodies and all those sort of horrible things. So in my parable, I want you to think that the Germans, they were known as the square heads by the Australians. And the Germans are like all the mental health services there are. 
their hospitals, their clinicians, their mental health services out in the community. And on the other side are the larrikins, the Australians, the larrikins. They're the ones with the lived experience. So the square heads say, oh, and both of them are working for the great cause, recovery. So the square heads say, let's meet in the middle with the larrikins. So eight of the square heads get up and go, and one larrikin is invited. And the larrikin trips over the barbed wire, straight on his face, and that's the end of the meeting. And the um, square heads think they've done a good job, you know. They've met about, they've met about the great cause. So another meeting is called, and this time 18 of the square heads come, and two of the larrikins, and the larrikins go, and they got there a bit better because there were two of them. They have their meeting, and they think they've achieved something. The larrikins aren't quite sure. So the larrikins say, we want, we want to have even numbers. So the larrikins meet the square heads in no man's land, and they have a meeting, and it all seems good. And they go back, but, and the larrikins think, look, it is good, but we can't quite understand the language that the Germans, the squareheads, are speaking in. So what do they do? They decide, the larrikins, the people with the lived experience, decide that they're going to learn German. So at the next meeting, when there's four of them, and four of the uh, square heads, they'll be able to converse really well. So I'm going to give you my bad German now. So they learn das Fienersen, Rico Managent, Vorstandsjolen, Führung, Finances, Risk Management, <laughs> Governance, Board Roles. And the larrikins are so pleased with him. But the square heads, for the first time, they say, you finally, finally understood our lived experience. <laughs> so <laughs> the parable is that we need, we need to be cautious and progress on with our lived experience leadership. Next slide, thanks. These are words of Mary O'Hagan, and that is that if lived experience leadership is to thrive, we need new roles, practices, and competencies. All of these need to be developed. And at a deeper level, there needs to be a philosophical, a psychological, and a political shift in the system. We really are at an incredibly exciting time for lived experience stuff. And if we could only embed recovery and support our leaders, things will change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. I fear I'm a square head. <laughs> I know I'm a square head, yeah. Look, I've taken a lot from your presentation, Debbie. The importance of clear roles, designated roles that are meaningful, with real tasks to do, that can be evaluated. But what's going to stay with me, apart from my square head, <laughs> is... Um, that lived experience leaders need to have, I think you said, fire in their belly. <laughs> a deep commitment to social justice and human rights. And that's what the most important contribution, or one of the important contributions they're going to make. So to further discuss the issues around people with a lived experience of mental health issues stepping into government governance roles, we have a panel. 
So I'm going to welcome our panel to the stage. But we have joining us via Zoom from New Zealand, Mary O'Hagan. Mary is the inaugural Executive Director of Lived Experience in the Mental Health and Wellbeing Division at Victoria's Health Department. She's here. <laughs> Mary was a key initiator of the psychiatric survivor movement in New Zealand. And Debbie, of course, referenced a lot of her work in her presentation. She has worked tirelessly for social justice. We also have Arandathi Jayakodi sitting alongside Mary in the middle of the panel here. Mary um, Randathi is a senior project lead at VMIAC. She has led the development of Consumers Leading in Governance, a pilot program using her extensive experience in the consumer movement to drive meaningful change. Randathi currently sits on Mind Australia's board. We also have Rod here, Rod Little. Rod is a proud Wolonyu and Wajak man of the Yamanchi and Noongar Nunna nations of Western Australia and lives in Canberra. As well as sitting on our board, we're very privileged to have Rod on our board, Rod runs the Vavangana Group, specialising in cultural integrity, governance and leadership. He is also former co-chair of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples, advocating for the rights and interests of First Nations people here and abroad. And we have Michael Gorton, our Wellways Board Chair, and he will facilitate the panel discussion. Michael will be known to many of you. He's a lawyer with more than 40 years experience and has extensive governance background in health and the community sectors. He has many roles, <coughs> including currently Chair's board and he chairs the Alfred Health Board. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. Welcome <coughs> everyone. And let me also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today. Note Sorry Day uh, and our responsibility in relation to Sorry Business, but also acknowledge that it's five years since the, state, the Uluru Statement of the Heart was first promulgated and offered to us. Uh, and we, I think, can be happy that we now seem to be advancing uh, in relation to that statement. And let me acknowledge Rod, of course, as a traditional uh, owner and leader uh, in our First Nations groups. The Royal Commission into the Victorian mental health system told us that it was essentially lived experience that had to be at the core of all that we did. So the structures that are being set up, the processes, the funding, the services, the connections, the works, uh, both existing and new, needed to place lived experience at the centre of all that occurred. Um, and so we all need to take that very seriously, particularly those of us, Wellways and other groups here tonight, uh, who are involved in the community health sector. And it's quite clear that there's no quick fix, as Deb has very eloquently shown us. Uh, and that, you know, and, and I'm one of the squareheads as a lawyer, I, I do governance in a very religious way. Uh, and so the voice of lived experience is a challenge. Um, I found that out some years ago, uh, we set up Reconciliation Victoria some time ago, uh, which had half traditional, half um, other community. And I had to write the constitution. And again, I'm a lawyer. I wrote a wonderful constitution that says we'll have voting and people will vote and we appoint people. And then I said, well, here's the you know, traditional constitution. Oh, no, that won't work for us. I said, well, how do I describe it? What do you mean describe it? It just works. So I wrote a constitution that I've never written before, which said the non-Aboriginal people will do this process and the Aboriginal people will do the process themselves, come back and tell us who are going to be the representatives for, for the organisation. So um, we need to change and we need to adapt to the circumstances. And so it's uncomfortable work. And it can't be just adding something on. It can't be just shoving something into an existing system. It has to be radically different. Uh, and so for Wellways, we're currently reviewing our constitution and we're seeking to make changes in consultation with, uh, in, in direct contact with people with lived experience. We are seeking to create a lived experience forum that will sit 
beside the board and advise the board and be consulted by the board, as well as having people with lived experience on the board. Um, and we're recruiting a senior management role to ensure that we have a lived experience strategic advisor to the organisation as a whole and ensure that those voices occur throughout our organisation, not just in our governance. Um, interestingly, our recent staff survey, uh, where we've, we saw the results about a month ago, showed that 58% of respondents, our staff, say that they have a lived experience of mental illness or mental distress and 32% self-identify as a carer. Um, and I think that's a powerful understanding of what we have as an organisation. So we've got a good basis to start from, but we need to do it properly. And as talking before, I think about, um, it's not just what we need to do, it's how you do it as well. The process is just as important as the outcome. So that's what we want to discuss today. Um, and uh, <coughs> I just want to acknowledge uh, Deb, who uh, does so much for our organisation already, but to be the the first in the resurrected lecture series, uh, and to have done it so well is just fantastic. Thank you, Deb. Um, so, Mary, welcome. You're a long way away, but you're very much close to us all tonight. So, great to have you here. Um, you've been charged okay. with, yeah. with looking after this area, taking responsibility for this area uh, within a huge system change that the Victorian government is undertaking. Um, and, and you're going to do it all by yourself too, I assume. That's the nature of the role? Uh, not at all. No. We have, a, in the lived experience branch, we have a team of 20, uh, and they do most of the work. I'm, I'm just the conductor. So, uh, and uh, then uh, we have, um, we work very closely with the lived experience communities, particularly the Peaks, Tandem and Bimiak. Uh And of course they have enormous outreach into uh, the communities and into uh, people's lived experience and services. So this is very much a combined effort. Terrific. And this really goes to the issue that we're talking about tonight, which is about ensuring the voice of lived experience is in our governance. Um, and in your case, ensuring the voice of lived experience is, is embedded throughout government uh, in all that's yeah. uh, occurring yeah. as well. So, so from your position and all the work that you've done, how do we get more lived experience people in, in the position? And um, what do we, that is the square heads, need to do to make sure that happens? Well, it, it's one it's thing one to thing create, create the positions. positions. It's quite it's another quite thing, thing to um, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, have, a have a position where position people want to stay in. Stay in. Uh, and uh, this is a big challenge, big challenge. Uh, that, uh, that we really we need really to, need uh, to uh, not just create just the create positions, positions, but, but uh, ensure uh, that sure people that feel safe and effective while they're occupying those positions. And, and this takes this a lot of hard work, work and reflection. reflection. Oh, on oh, the, oh, in the case in of the square heads, heads, if you like, if you like uh, and a lot of a lot of listening, learning the language of the Larrikins, I think it is, isn't it? Yeah. So, so um, I, I think the need. Yeah. So it really. Um, it really, it really isn't, isn't easy, easy. Uh, and, uh, and one thing that one we've thing got to be really, really uh, sometimes, sometimes we just have, we to, have rethink to rethink everything, everything. And, and you, you, you gave, an gave an example of that just that earlier, on on earlier on in your, in your uh, relationship with Aboriginal, people. Aboriginal people. people, and it's the and same, same in a different sense with people with lived experience. There's a lot of unlearning that has to happen in order for uh, people, uh, people uh, in the system, uh, in the to, be system to be able to create spaces, spaces where we can be we both can effective, be uh, feel valued feel and, safe. and safe. Any early learnings at this stage or suggestions for organisations like ours? Um, um, be humble. Be humble. Uh, 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 do things, do that, you things that you thought were impossible. Were impossible. Um, um, imagine, imagine wildly, wildly that, things, that could things could be different. Could be different. Uh, 
uh, one of the uh, great, of the great inhibitors, inhibitors of any transformation, of any transformation uh, well, there's two uh, well, there's big two inhibitors, big inhibitors of, any of, any of any transformation. One of them one is of lack of courage, courage, and the other is the lack other of imagination. And, and uh, you, uh, I can see I that, can see uh, that uh, in many in transformation, many transformation efforts, efforts that we that, we, that people that lack people these two qualities. qualities. And, and really, what really it what, uh, what what it means what is that means people is continue that business as usual with a few add-ons. Very true. Arendithi, you're um, in charge of a program that is going to equip and help people yeah. uh, take on these roles. So what what do we need to ensure that lived experience is seen to be equal with and valued within an organisation? Um, and um, what, what do we need to change to make it work within an organisation? Do we need different expertise? Do we need different structures, different processes? What, what have you learnt so far? Uh, Michael, I think the biggest thing is recognising that it's a collective responsibility. Um, so when we were putting together the program, we spoke with many board members, including you and also consumer board members. One of the things that clearly came through was board members said, oh yeah, the consumer board member, they're there to hold us accountable. And my question was, well, isn't that the role of the whole board, accountability? And then when we spoke to the consumer board members, they said, look, it always falls on us to talk about lived experience, right? And the question then, you know, for me was um, at a board level, it's collective decision making, collective responsibility. So everybody needs to have an understanding of lived experience, the power dynamics that uh, Debbie talked about. Um, just like the whole board is expected to have basic knowledge of financial literacy, strategic thinking. So it's the entire board's responsibility and the entire mental health sector's responsibility to understand what we mean by lived experience and lived experience knowledge. Um, and the other thing is also, I think we need to um, uh, reframe our thinking. We need to stop thinking about the person and the illness and think at a systems level. Um, so for example, when we do face challenges or failures, Often what happens is we say, oh, peer workers, they can't survive. You know, they couldn't cope. The really good example is a couple of years ago, uh, Professor Gordon Parker gave this um, lecture where he talked about uh, young psychiatrist registrars burning out and leaving the system. All the um, Sydney uh, newspaper front pages, that, that was the headline. And for me, I thought, wow, okay, young psychiatrists are leaving because of the system. But with peer workers, what we hear day in, day out is our oh, peer workers can't cope. So the conversation is around the person and the illness. But we need to reframe the conversation to go, well, where's the system failure? What's the culture that contributed to it? <laughs> so you, your program is going to provide um, uh, you know, skills and experiences for people with lived experience to join boards and be participate in governance. What do the people who are already there need to do? Um, Michael, I think that's the second part of our program, I think. <laughs> we were very much aware <laughs> that there needs to be a second part of it in terms of preparing boards. Mm. So we are asking, part of um, our program is actually asking um, consumers to do a placement to go and observe boards. Um, and in that, when we you know, when you're preparing the participants, one of the things we said was, look, you might hear things that would shock you and really offend you. We need to sit with that discomfort because it's an education process. And then again, making boards and people in, in the system realize this is a collective responsibility because otherwise it's often on the person with the lived experience to educate the rest of the team. But we can't continue to do that anymore. So, Rod, you've had an interesting life uh, in, well, I suppose politics a, a bit along the way and government certainly. Um, how do we break down the power differential that is clearly going to exist as we bring a whole group, a new group of people into the governance of our structures? What, what, what have you seen has worked or what have you experienced and, and seen when we're successful and when we fail? Thanks, uh, Michael, for that question. And thanks, Deb, for your presentation. That was um, 
really enlightening and there's been so many things as you were saying. For myself and my experience and my people have had to walk in two worlds for as long as I can remember. Historically we've had always some form of order in people making decisions for our welfare and so on. Till colonisation, and though perhaps, I don't like to use the word, but those square heads came and um, <laughs> created, <laughs> created uh, infiltrated the larrikins, if you like. Um, and one of the things that, is, uh, that has been very hard for me to challenge is from that, and you get resistance from a human rights position to challenge a system that's been created by others um, that is always about your problem and we've got a system on how to fix that problem. And there's many things that we can't unlearn and that's the challenge, I think, as Marion said. Unlearn something that you've learned to do something different is a challenge. Um, I don't have any initials apart from a member of the uh, uh, Australian Institute of Company Directors at the end of my name or a, or a PhD, but I think I might have recalled talking to you when I had an interview you, with you, Michael, that I have a PhD in lived experience. We all have our stories. We've all learned from those stories. And if you can recall when um, you're a child, the first things you learnt was don't touch. <laughs> don't touch. So, so we carry those learnings with us. And I think that when we, we look into the future now, um, uh, I think next week, Reconciliation Week, is be brave, make change. So that's, that's the key thing. Reflect on your learnings, on your lived experience. And, you know, weigh out what the consequences are. But how we've learnt to govern, how we've learnt to manage, how we've learnt to develop programs, you know, that's set in stone. But there is a fear by some to challenge that. So what if... In your experience, what, what, what works and what doesn't work? What are the things we need to do and what are the things we shouldn't do? Yeah, yeah look, I, fundamentally, I think letting down the guard, you know, taking away those walls of protection and saying what you can and can't do. Um, and all of programs have got a set of policies and procedures and guidelines, you know, we've, we've got them, we've got them. What is it that we actually want to achieve? from the program. How do we know that it has had an impact? We ask the person that is supposed to benefit. The beneficiaries can tell us that this has worked. Um, and I hear all the time about programs that worked really well 10, 20 years ago that they won't do it now. Or if you've heard it, oh, we tried that once it didn't work. But according to who? According to the beneficiary? Mm. I don't know. But usually it's the decision makers according to. Mm. I'll ask this question to both Mary and, and uh, Aranda thing. What, what supports, what, what additionally do we need to put in place to ensure that people lived experience feel supported through the process, are able to express themselves, okay. feel empowered, are there critical things we need to change to make sure that the, their voices are heard? Um, when we're talking about governance, we're talking about pretty rigid structures that we've been in for a long time. Um, and yes, we want, we want other people to change. We don't want to change ourselves, but it's we who have to change. Mary, are you putting in those sorts of systems or processes uh, in the work uh, that you're doing in Victoria? Uh well, around I think I'd probably talk more to the work that's been done in governance. Um, you know, the thing that I value most when I'm working with people who don't have lived experience, um, 
I have to say, sometimes this thing, how can we support people? How can we do this? It, it feels almost like uh, we're a bit like China and we might break if, um, if uh, things don't go very well. So, so and I think um, the thing that really I value more than anything is people who go out and fight for us, who, who, who will, um, when they're in a situation and um, there's resistance about lived experience, that they will uh, put their, themselves on the line to, um, to argue our cause. And uh, that's the real test of commitment, I think. Um, but, but I'll leave Arandathy to answer the particular governance question. Um, now I'm trying to think what did I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, look, uh, what, so um, one of the things I think Rod also said is what can we do in terms of governance is um, there's the language thing, which uh, Debbie touched on. As uh, Laura said, I'm a relatively new board member. I've been there for about 12 months. And I've been reflecting on this a lot. I came to Australia when I was 12. I think we arrived on a Tuesday, and then my parents went and enrolled us. Uh, at, I was in year seven uh, to school on a Wednesday. I could read and write very well. I knew what was happening in the classroom, but I couldn't articulate. I couldn't speak well. I was afraid to speak, right? But I knew my stuff. And I found the same thing in the boardroom. I know my stuff. I know about, you know, how. Um, what do you call complaints, policy, et cetera, is about promoting self-determination, okay. how important out outcomes are, not outputs. So I've been trying to, I was trying to do something and I said, look, I want to, I want the board to pay more attention to the outcomes. And, and then one of the other board members said, oh yes, non-financial KPIs. We need to talk about non-financial KPIs. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's what it was. So, and I was like, oh, but that's what I've been trying to say. Um, so I think language is a really big thing and we need to be mindful of. Um, and I think that's the other thing we were trying to do with the governance program is that consumers have had very little opportunity uh, to sit in these spaces, things like financial literacy, enterprise risk, and all that sort of stuff. And where, but you know, these are concepts that are intrinsic to a lot of people because if they've sat on consumer advisory group for God knows how long, but you know, some of the first things that come is the privacy policy and the surveys, right? But it's about how do you translate it at that governance level? Um, that's what we were trying to do with one of the things we were trying to do with the program. Um, and the other thing is we had Margaret Grigg as a panel member last Tuesday, who's now the CEO of Forensic I think she might be in the audience. She said something that really, really struck with me. She's, because she trained as a mental health nurse. And she said, it is very difficult to sit around a table and hear that what I was taught best practice actually caused people harm. Yeah. And she said, it's very difficult, but we have to do that. And not everybody is prepared to do that. And I think that's what we want from our allies. When we lived experience people lie in the room, for people to have the humility and the patience to, to listen. Yeah. Um, it might be difficult to listen, to hear, yeah. If you could just quickly, <laughs> that's, that's it. awesome. <laughs> um, just quickly add to that, um, Michael, as many organisations and particularly First Nations organisations, there's the rules about being becoming uh, incorporated, a set of rules, and a, go a board set up, and all of those things. Um, and a lot of our people with their lived experience are afraid to do that because they're afraid of all the requirements, don't understand what the rules are. And so one of the things that I feel has worked is trying to bring together the um, a cultural uh, governance to this is to set up aside a cultural authority that can inform the governing of the organisation. So they're there to comply, you know, with everything, uh, make sure that there's finances are expanded and, and may tick all the boxes that that governments are asking about. 
But if you empower the, um, the people on the cultural authority, that's what they know best. And when you invite an individual to participate or ask what they think, they feel valued. They feel like they have a place in this world to, to do what needs to be done and they can contribute. So that's one thing that I think has worked in the past, but there are the competing um, systems, if you like, and it depends on whose lens you're looking through about what is it you want to do. Um, but at the end of the day, like I said, it is the people that will tell you that they are benefiting from the way that you do your business and why, what you're offering. It's interesting, for some decades now, uh, public hospitals are, are required to have a community advisory committee. So we're ostensibly bringing in consumers, patients, family members to provide their views. And I think it's fair to say I've seen the worst and the best. Mm. Uh, the worst are the ones where you're asked to come to give your views, but you're actually told what's happening and told how things are going. And there isn't sort of a question at the end of it all. Um, and uh, whereas I think the best is when issues are put on the table, here are some facts, no jargon, because jargon's a barrier, um, and this is our problem, and then ask open-ended questions about, well, you know, why do you think this is happening or what do you think we can do to improve it or, you know, what, what should it look like? Um, is, this, is this the right way? Um, so I, I, I suspect as we um, embrace lived experience, within our organisations, we will need to make sure that we deliberately set up the appropriate structures and opportunities and develop the conversations more um, to, to make sure that, that it is effective. Michael, um, when you talk about structures, can I say something? Um, I think one of the really important things is that we need to get the systems architecture right mm. in terms of governance. So how do we... Um, uh, give you an example. So the interim report of the Royal Commission said uh, um, we must have the interim office and it must have people with a lived experience. Um, but it didn't specify that there needs to be people in leadership. And this is the Royal Commission interim report, right? What happened? The government appointed a CEO and clinical, uh, clinical senior advisor. And it was after that, once the agenda was set, that there was a consumer and care advisor appointed, and they were not at a senior senior um, executive level, right? And then what you will see in the final report of the um, Royal um, Commission is it actually explicitly say that in the recommendation, not in the commentary, that the regional boards must have people with a lived experience, the commission must, and the department must. So what we see is that we, we need a clear mandate. It must be clearly articulated because otherwise it might seem obvious, but we just yeah. seem to keep doing the same thing. So the other example is if you look at the letters patent for the Royal Commission, the letters patent said that the expert advisory committee must have two people with a lived experience. So yes, from the beginning it did. The National Disability Insurance um, NDIS legislation says that the Independent Advisory Council must have people with a lived experience, so it always does. So I think in this reform agenda, while all this legislation is going through, we need to make sure that this is enshrined in legislation, that consumer leadership, that that's yeah. at a government level, but in the community sector, like you said, we need to make sure that we get it in the constitutions, our policies yeah. and TORs. Because otherwise what happens is when there's a change in the board, when there's a change in leadership, when there's a change in government, the first thing to go is the lived experience leadership positions. So Mary, you're part of the development of the new system and implementing the Royal Commission's recommendations. Um, and of course, some of these bodies are being created at the moment. Can you tell us how we are making sure that those, those sorts of issues are embraced uh, in the new system, the start. Uh, well, it's difficult, uh, even when it's enshrined in uh, legislation. Um, I'm continually amazed at the uh, power of the status quo um, uh, and how it um, it just 
it is it's enormous and so um uh obviously um oh, and then and then there's the issue of uh definition so uh, some of us lately have been coming across an expanded definition of lived experience uh to include people who are working in services and so uh, there's all sorts of things that we need to watch out for uh, in order to keep true to the uh, to the spirit of the the Royal Commission. Uh, and I and I think it's um, I mean we're making progress, but it it uh, it's never straightforward. Uh, and um, old thinking um, is uh, is everywhere, basically. Um, in, in the interest of full disclosure, some of us in the room are involved in the expert advisory group advising on the new Mental Health Act. <laughs> and it just seems to me that it's a chicken and egg that we're trying to put up an act that transforms the sector, but there are the voices that say, well, we're not funded for that. You know, we, ha we haven't got the structures in place. We haven't got the resources to do it. And so which, which comes first and, and old thinking T can take over, I think, in those circumstances. So I suppose uh, as a consequence of that, as our organisations, community health organisations, seek to move on this pathway, we have to recognise that this is an investment. Mm. This isn't just something you can sort of toss into an organisation. You need preparation and you need to apply the resources for it. Mm. Um, thoughts on the types of resources we should be looking at? Certainly not the status quo, because mm. I think that's the challenge. That's the easiest way out. Um, seeking the innovation, uh, the imagination of lived experience. Trying to imagine what the consequence or the, the outcome might be, rather than saying, well, this is a risk. Um, there are pieces of legislation around the country that have um, that have been resisted for change, but I think I know from my perspective in in Canberra in the ACT we took the lead of Victoria's uh, Human Rights Charter to develop our own um, Aboriginal or well, Human Rights Act in the ACT, which included Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural rights, economic rights. And, and the rest of it. But, it. but the sky hasn't fallen in since, but there was so much resistance to it. I think where there is a, the conversation that is had is about, okay, here is a section of the act that we need to embed um, lived experience in. Let's discuss that. Let's define that, have an agreement on that and what its purpose is. That is very clear. Um, and then when the rules, as you say, when you get to write the constitution and the rules for uh, your organisation and your services and, and you know, for the delivery of programs, the authority lies within yourself, your organisation, the people that are involved in the organisation to change those rules. It's the rules that are in the system are the hardest to change, and they maintain the status quo, I believe. Mm. And we, we embark on the pathway, we bring new people in at levels of the organisation, including at the highest levels, but there's this strong sense of, you know, the, the, the old thinking taking over, the, mm. the culture of the organisation dominating. How do we make sure that we don't just fall back into the previous ways, or that the people we bring in with the voice of lived experience somehow become inculcated and just sort of accept the culture that is dominant, at least at the start, um, and so that we don't get the benefit of the change. How do we make sure that that drift, if you like, doesn't occur so that you know we, we get back to single think again? Mary? I, I can't overestimate the importance of allies and... Um, Debbie mentioned this in her talk. Uh, one, of, one of the, so there's, 
some of us with lived experience, there's a lot more people um, who don't have lived experience. And the more of them that, uh, you know, kind of fight in our corner or uh, champion our, our interests are the better. Um, because uh, it, it um, I think for people with lived experience, uh, sometimes we have a sense that we're on our own with this. Uh, and that can be kind of burdens, burdensome. Yeah. So allies are absolutely, we, we couldn't do it without allies. Which means we need to do something about that deliberately, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. We need, yeah. We need I mean, to an build. ally has to be consciously uh, unlearning, relearning, uh, listening and actively supporting us. That's what That's allyship right. is about. Arendithi, what do you advise the people that you place in organisations? Um, look, I think what is really important, I think Debbie said, to keep the fire in the belly, um, you really need the... Um, you need to hang out with each other. <laughs> 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 because this is hard work. And it's isolating, even if there's two of you in the room. So we really need to create space and mechanisms for people to come together. Uh, call it community of practice or whatever it is. But we really need to create that space. And again, organisations need to support that and recognise that and resource that. I think that, that's a really, really important part of it. For me, Michael, it, it's about, uh, as Mary is saying, you know, having the allies but understanding the environment where you may have competitors. So in that, in that environment, um, the allies are great. Having the conversation, what really I think attracts people and certainly has, is having values is where you will build your alliance. Your values, you meet the value, you like those values, you want to contribute. Um, uh, but sometimes people are hesitant about contributing and less invited. Um, but if you create that environment for someone to have a look at what your values are, each of us have our values. We, there is goodness in all of us. Mm. We want to do something that's right and that is good. Um, let's have a conversation, find out, do we match up? Let's hang out then, eh? Um, and then we think about, well, what it is that we're trying to do and we're trying to make a difference, trying to make someone's life better, then that is when you're on the path, I think. So let's put a COVID overlay on all of that because we've yep. all been meeting by Zoom. We, how do we find the time? We, we need to find the time to have the conversations. Mm. So probably outside the boardroom or I think the Wellways board, we had our meetings, which were the meetings that we had agendas, and then we had the coffee conversation catch-ups um, which we, we also do at the Alfred, where there's a single issue which is a starting point for a discussion. Um, and it's, it's important to have the, build those personal relationships. If you're all together, you can go and have a coffee together. You can meet earlier. You can, you've got time. We need to make sure that we, we find the time to make that happen. So if yeah. we're just going to rush in and rush out, that's not going to cement the relationships no. that need to be created. So I, I was going to sort of finish up with a question to each of you, which is um, the challenges that we face, the opportunities that, for example, in Victoria, the new Mental Health Act uh, and system offers, um, but, but recognising the challenges. What is the one word that is most meaningful to you uh, in how we look at those challenges, how we address the opportunities? What, what's the one word that sort of strikes you as um, how you feel about all that's about to happen? I'll go in reverse order. Rod. First, first word that comes to mind that I think will um, set us on a path is trust. Great word. Arandithi. Um, be bold. Bold. There's so much appetite and goodwill right now. I think we've really got to stretch ourselves. Thank you. Mary. Well, I like those two words, but I'll add vision. Fantastic. Um, I think that 
gives us a great starting point. I think it's been a great discussion. Um, Deb has set us on the pathway, and I think we've taken just a little few more steps along mm. that pathway that, that Deb mapped out for us. Um, the word I like to use, as Laura knows, is journey. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a journey we need to undertake, um, but a journey hopefully that will be an easy, not easy, a, a pleasant journey because we know of what it's intended to achieve. The outcome will be so worth it. So would you please thank our panel this evening, Mary, Rod and Randolph. Thank you. I, of course, would deeply like to thank the panel. What a wonderful conversation um, that um, you facilitated, Michael, and the, con the generous contribution of Aranithi, Rod and Mary. It's been fantastic. For me, I'm certainly going to go back and um, listen to the panel discussion because there was so much gold in what you said. I've written a couple of words for me that are going to stay with me. I've always been interested in the process of unlearning and the belief that you have to unlearn something to learn something new. So that's going to stay with me. I think Mary talked about being brave, being bold. I think that was your word around it. Um, and that we must be that to make change. I like the idea around it of formalising positions. And that gives it some protection, I think, for the future. But being very aware of the pull and power of the status quo. I think they call that homeostasis <laughs> in um, biology. We must be aware and be alert to that. And for me personally, I take away something I wrote down was, how can I be a better ally in the work I do every day? Thank you so much. And I think we have some flowers for the panellists. Thank you. And for Debbie, a special thank you for you. Thank you. And Mary, there will be some flowers for you upon your return from New Zealand, for sure. <laughs> of course, what we've been talking about tonight and what we recognise is the journey to consumer leadership. It can be fraught and needs to be supported. The Victorian Mental Illness Awareness Council's VMEAX Consumers Leading and Governance Program is designed to do just that. And I think, Arandathy, you mentioned that there's maybe a other program about how boards <laughs> can transform as well. This specialist governance training for mental health consumers is the first of its kind in Australia, designed by consumers for consumers. Worldways is extremely proud to be one of the finance foundational sponsors of this program, alongside Mental Health Victoria and NEMI. And we're really happy and pleased to help officially launch the groundbreaking training tonight. Please welcome VMEAX, James Horton and SJ Hayward to the stage to launch the program. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Uh -huh. So I okay. creep behind you. I'll stand here. Okay. Well, what a wonderful turnout. Um, I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the um, traditional custodians of the land, the Bunurong, Boon Wurrung, and the Wurundjeri, Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. Peoples who, by my sort of rough guesstimate, have probably been calling this place home for maybe 60, 70, 80,000 generations, which is a which when you think about it is a long time. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to recognise those with a lived experience in mental health who have suffered and suffer from, have suffered from past mistreatment and neglect. And to those that are suffering now, and I commit to honouring their experiences by affirming their right to live with dignity and to strive to create better, safer and more compassionate mental health systems, services and communities. Well, what a great discussion. 
And what a great talk, Debbie. I mean, I think um, just my initial observations, and I'm a bit like Laura, there's, there's sort of two sides to this too. On the one hand, there's this let's imagine courageously. And on the other hand, I picked up from Debbie's comment is that whole notion that we've got, we've got our elders and the stories. And so in embracing the future, how do we do that without losing sight of where we've been? And, and I think we're at that particular point where there are so many possibilities, we are in danger of lo losing sight of where we've come from. And you know, how we do that is, a, is, is maybe a whole nother, another discussion. But I also think the other side is this whole, I guess, dimension between survive, you know, our survivability and thrivability. So in the sense of that previous generation really defined on how to be a great survivor. And now we're sort of being called on to say, well, how do we, how do we become thrivers? Um, so I think it's really remarkable that we're having this conversation at all. I mean, if I look back uh, just a few years, I don't think I could imagine um, uh, <laughs> yet, yet sort of um, here we are. And I was also reflecting on that, on the, you know, on the saying, nothing about us without us. And I think the discussion really might challenge us to look maybe a little bit beyond. Because when you think about it, nothing without us, about us without us, in a way speaks to being heard and involved. But we're now talking about being called to lead. So maybe we need to find another phrase or a new phrase with us together. The Consumers Leading and Governance Program is, is, is really our response to addressing this need to build a new generation of consumer leaders. And I say that in a non-ageist sense. It's a new cohort, maybe. We believe the program to provide specialist governance training for mental health consumers is a groundbreaking one certainly in Australia, but arguably much further abroad. Um, developed by consumers, for consumers, the, it, the program is six months long, currently being piloted with two cohorts, um, offering participants both theoretical and practical learning experiences. The de defining feature of the course is its placement of consumer perspectives on governance. So in addition to the governance training subject areas like financial literacy, risk, strategy, the program also addresses power imbalances that exist in almost all governance arrangements and settings. The training part of the program comprises eight four-day workshops, and we've just had 31 participants complete their first workshops and are about set to start their placements. And for the placements, participants will have the opportunity, as I think has been mentioned, to sit in on and observe you know, three or so board or subcommittee meetings to experience firsthand how their learnings might apply in real life settings. And it's our hope that these placements will also provide participants with opportunities to develop valuable relationships that may lead to potential governance roles. So I guess in a way too, the big challenge is we'll have a whole, you know, with their first two cohorts of enthusiastic consumer leaders, one of the challenges is what do we do with that? In the sense that, you know, it's a bit like learning a new language. Um, we also have an obligation to find um, you know, places and ways to, t to harness that enthusiasm. And finally, we'll be establishing an alumni network with a calendar of events through to 2023 to provide an ongoing forum for professional development, networking and support. Now, as an independently funded program, this wouldn't exist but from the support for the sector. So that support, in a word, has been overwhelming. And I guess it starts with well ways. I mean, we were confident the program would find support. We just didn't realise how much. Um, our foundational sponsors, Wellways, NEMI and the Mental Health Victoria, really our special thanks and appreciation for what you've done. But it's, as I say, it's been, it's been extraordinary. Um, so to Tony and Tom, um, to Leanne, I think, uh, who's here, I think, somewhere, um, Damien from Mental Health Victoria um, and Laura, uh, thank you. And that's really just the start. I mean, when we looked at, you know, there were more than 20 organisations that sponsored and offered placements along the way. So, um, and again, overwhelming. And I think it speaks volumes that we are where we are as a sector, that so many organisations have come together in this way. Um, I also need a shout out to the participants, and while SJ is going to talk a little bit about that from a participant perspective, um, the feedback has been, well, overwhelming. Um, to our workshop facilitators, we've had some really amazing people 
um, and we owe them our deepest gratitude and thanks, many of whom offered their time on a pro bono basis. And to each of you, your presence, your support and your lived experiences added inspiration to knowledge. And to the project team, a huge thanks for getting this program up in really a relatively short six months to design and develop, to secure the support, sponsorship and funding, um, to wrangle facilitators, develop and publish content and manage the logistics of delivering it. And for that, uh, really, Arandathy is kind of front and centre. Um, almost need, I reckon we almost needed a cape. And a <laughs> <laughs> it was just um, astonishing. I don't think without Arandathy's leadership, this would have been remotely possible. And a big thanks to Alex McAfee and um, Bryony Wilson, who a couple of our staff who um, just did an amazing job in pulling the pieces together. And finally, a special thanks to our former chair, Cathy Wilson, I'm not sure if she's here, but who really uh, last year saw, had the foresight to see the need and provided the impetus to get this started. And so while there's a capability lap, the good news gap, there's uh, good news is that there are plenty of consumers willing to put up their hands and organisations willing to sponsor them. Our experience in developing this program has also impressed us the, on us the need for leadership training tailored to consumers and the value of scaling a program such as this up over the coming years. I have little doubt that as we evaluate the program in the months to come, this will only become more apparent. At Vimeac, we have an enduring commitment to supporting new and emerging consumer leaders now more than ever. Together we'll continue to make a difference and together we'll ensure the consumer perspective is acknowledged so that we might inform decision making at all levels. So we thank again those who have already offered their support for this program in its pilot stage and we look forward to partnering with stakeholders more widely to sustain this going forward with us together. You're going to stand here. And, you're going to stand there and be. Oh, you're not going to be my wingman. Okay. okay All right. <laughs> Look, I've just been guilty. Yeah. Of standing up here. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm S. J. Hayward. I'm one of the participants in the Consumers Leading in Governance program. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, um, so that then I can tell you my deep dark governance secrets, um, and then a bit about my experience of the program. So um, I am, I suppose, an emerging leader, I'd, I'd say, in the Victorian consumer landscape. I recently worked as the senior consumer advisor for the Royal Commission. I was on the expert advisory committee with Arandathy. And um, I also lead the Big Fields Club, which is a uh, grassroots peer support initiative. We've had a million downloads of our content and we were a finalist for a, a um, Vic Health Award. Now I say all of those impressive things so that I can tell you my de my, my, all my governance mishaps, of which I'll just tell you one, which is that um, I remember several years ago, uh, I think it was probably like at the end of my day job, having to then read a committee paper for an important committee and being faced with 150 pages on risk matrices. And I could have cried. I was so confronted and I did not know um, a lot about that area, but also didn't feel like I was in a position where I could ask for help or there were things that existed that could have supported me to really understand my role in that space. And since then, I've also been involved on the um, team that put together what does the structure of consumers in governance um, look like in the new reformed mental health commission, uh, new in, uh, reformed mental health system as part of the Royal Commission. And I remember at the time going through that process and thinking, okay, we're going to have all these positions and how are people going to do this? Um, thinking of my uh, I could cry risk matrices experience, it definitely dawned on me that something like this program was definitely um, needed. And in terms of thinking about why this is important, I think many people have, have really touched on that today, but I wanted to quote a um, senior mental health executive who said to me, once the dusty subjects is where all of the power is. And followed that up by saying, that's why they keep them boring. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of the, what's covered in this program, you will have on your seat this book. And if you turn to page six and seven, 
This is the core content that I was lucky enough to recently um, get to go through um, with an amazing um, team of facilitators and support from Vimeac. And what I want to point out is that this isn't actually Governance 101 as you would see it from other institutes that are um, delivering this kind of training, but this is specifically tailored for people that are going into consumer governance roles. So things like consumer perspective, culturally adaptive governance frameworks, as well as um, the dusty subjects, um, like uh, board roles and responsibilities and uh, finance for board members. And to just like give an example of, um, of how this plays out, because I think one thing that I want to touch on that was mentioned a few times tonight was around how often folks at this stage of our development end up in these roles and aren't always sure what your role is. Like, what am I specifically doing here? And I think that uh, one example um, that I thought was great around how the program was put together was thinking around it, the subjects really built on each other. And on the last day, we had an awesome uh, workshop on human rights frameworks. And because we had previously done um, a subject on risk matrices, we could have a really in-depth conversation around how do we use human rights frameworks and embed them into risk matrices and carry that into enterprise risk as a way and a way of using the square head language. Um, but I think using this language of um, how big organizations work to actually achieve the goals and aims and the human rights of consumers. Um, so I think for me, that was a very big eye opener in terms of, I think it, it kind of unlocked some of this around how these subjects can work together in very, um, I would say, innovative and creative ways that are led by um, consumers. Um, the last thing I'd say is, well, not the last thing, I've got a few more things, but um, uh, I think that one of the things that's difficult, I think at the moment, many consumers are very keen, but also can be quite intimidated because these rooms are intimidating. And I think that a number of people have spoken about that um, tonight. And I think that the way that this program is run by consumers, for consumers, um, in an environment where you can question and grow, um, that you're not expected to have all of the answers, that we could have some of the facilitators come in and say, actually, I'm a lawyer and I didn't understand any of this stuff before I got here, um, was really helpful to make these uh, subjects just much more approachable for folks. And one more thing that I wanted to say is just kind of a provocation because tonight we've been talking around how, like a lot of what we've been talking around is how can we get lived experience governance into mental health organizations that are already established, which is awesome. But I also want to think around how training like this is actually essential to establish a thriving network of peer-led organizations that do not yet exist um, or that are in a very, um, emergent stage. So this is obviously coming from my own experience running Big Fields Club, which has been running for the past five years. And we've had, it's definitely a very grassroots endeavor. We've had a lot of accolades and awards and project funding and, um, and we've done it all on a shoestring. And now we're kind of thinking, how do we actually become part of this change? How do we scale up? And a big part of how do we reach those hurdles is around understanding the governance structures, being able to put them in place to make sure that these kinds of organizations can establish, emerge, and um, thrive in the new system. So um, I would like to uh, thank Vimiac for their incredible le leadership and the team that are involved, especially Arandathy. I think that, I hope that Vimiac can continue initiating these really innovative programs um, th to support the growth of consumer leadership. And I want to also acknowledge that this program was put together in six months. Um, so a really mean feat to put together and much needed given how fast reforms are happening and all these opportunities are coming up. Um, and I just, uh, and I want to, um, two last things. I think governance is such a key piece because it's about putting consumers near the, 
closer to the locus of control of what happens. So if we can get this piece right, it will have flow on effects all the way down. Um, and I want to end with a quote from Mary, who I think is not here anymore, so I won't embarrass her. But um, she says, it takes leaders at all levels with courage and imagination to drive deep change. The status quo, as flawed as it is, has all the advantages of incumbency and familiarity. There are rare moments when the waves crest for change. We need to seize those moments to take us further on the journey. Thank you all. Thank you for being part of the journey. Oh my God. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, SJ and James. And perhaps I can say, SJ, incumbency isn't always an advantage, okay? <laughs> as we heard on, oh, as we saw on the weekend. Um, <laughs> I am feeling exceptionally energised, um, more energised than challenged. So I think it's been a fantastic evening. Relaunching the Worldways Public Lecture Series at a time of massive reform within our mental health system is an absolute honour. And it is with pleasure tonight that I can announce, thanks to a generous legacy gift from Frank Woodcock, that we will be back again with the public lecture for many years to come. And we will be naming this public lecture the Woodcock Lecture in the family's honour. The Woodcock family has for decades invested in bringing people together to creating positive change for people experiencing mental health challenges. Unfortunately, none of Frank's family members are able to attend tonight. But I would like to extend my deep and sincere gratitude to the Woodcock family and their commitment to promoting public interest in mental health and wellbeing. Thank you. I know it has led to many improvements and better outcomes for people experiencing mental and emotional challenges and their families. So we will see you again next year. I'm very happy. But please remember the discussion tonight. It has been recorded and I think it has been a call to action. So let's take up the challenge. Thank you to anybody and everybody who's played a role this evening and a special thanks to Debbie Hamilton. I don't know why you were initially reluctant. <laughs> You've got lots to say. <laughs> I invite everybody to stay for light refreshments um, after the, for the, um, this evening concludes. Thank you so much and see you next year. <laughs>